Okay, and here we go. Hi, everybody. Hey, good morning, everyone. Give folks a few seconds to get in. It's so good to see so many folks on a early Sunday morning. And if we can um, mute your lines, I think I'm good. I think you should have the function, Anna, to have everyone enter on mute. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. There it is. Okay. All right. I think we are ready to start. It looks like we have gotten everyone in, and we are so happy to have folks join us again on a beautiful Sunday morning. I hope and pray it's beautiful where you are. Uh, welcome. If this is your first session with the SEED Conference, welcome. If you're coming back after a jam-packed uh, last evening, welcome back. Uh, we are so glad to have you with us, have you join us. Uh, this is Seed Saving 101, and the title is Unearthing Seed Stories from Personal and Practical. And uh, my co-moderator, she put the actual uh, revised title in the chat for you to look at it, but I will refer to the new title and description. And really briefly, we're gonna be coming from uh, talking about seed stories, uh, food stories. What are the seeds that tell your story? How can we build community around our seed and food work as people grounded in our own culture within the Northeast seed community, our collective stories, we have a larger tapestry of culture and history. And we'll be talking and exercising and unearthing those seed stories. And we really will uh, implore you and invite you to tell some of your seed stories as well. The NOFA New York Winter Conference and the Northeast Organic Seed Conference join together every two years. And you're participating in the third collaboration, which is wonderful. Please enjoy as many workshops at, at this dual online conference as possible during the next week. I've gone to a few, they are totally outstanding. My name is Anna Muhammad, and I uh, live in Springfield, Massachusetts, which is Pecumtuck area. I work, I garden, I teach in Springfield, Massachusetts. I work for NOFA Mass, so I'm your neighbor. I will be assisting with some of the Zoom tech today as well as some of, of the moderation with Jackie Pilati, um, our co-moderator. In another time, we would be together at a conference center somewhere in person. And after a long drive, a long flight, a long train ride, we would get together, we would share hugs, we would share travel stories and really just bond. If it was someone we had never met, we'd share a handshake or maybe a hug. But since we're in this new medium of Zoom, of the uh, internet universe, we're gonna try and recreate that feeling here and really engage in learning, engage our hearts and minds in sharing. What you're looking at now is some community agreements. So we're gonna do a little housekeeping and I'm not going to go into every point. You have this on the screen. You have this in your socio uh, program book so you can go back and refer to it over and over again. I'm just going to pull some key points. Uh, first, be curious listen actively and seek clarity with questions. We are here to learn from one another. Um, make sure that you are patient, that if you mention any jargon, whether it's NOFA, the Northeast Organic Farming Association or another scientific term, explain it. Don't assume everyone um, knows that off the bat. And then lastly, we are in a virtual world. Technology sometimes doesn't always work with us. So we do ask and implore that you be patient as we're working through this new medium and we'll try to make it as painless for you as possible. Land, we want to acknowledge the land that we all are on. If you notice, I mentioned that I am broadcasting from Pecumtuck land, which is the original people who were here in the Springfield area. They are the original owners of the area. What you're looking at now 
is a map that can assist you of pointing out who actually was on the land before European colonization and white supremacy which we're currently dealing with now. Uh, take that time to look at that website. You can point out where, um, what uh, indigenous family is actually on that land. And we wanna take some time now to give a moment of silence, of prayer or mindfulness of the family that was here before. So we'll take a few seconds for that. Thank you all for taking that moment. We definitely wanna show gratitude and solidarity with our indigenous family. We also want to offer a resource from Living Color Virtual BIPOC Black Indigenous People of Color Space, which is being held throughout the conference this week. They had a wonderful kickoff session yesterday and they will be having open hours throughout the week. Um, we give thanks to the support of the facilitators, Amanda David and Mandana Bushi um, for providing that assistance. If you need them at all, uh, they are available 24 seven via email. There is their uh, email addresses there. So do not hesitate to reach out to them with any questions, any concerns. And again, we are so grateful of having them with us during this week. We will have UVM note takers uh, that will be in the session with us. Uh, we may have set, have them here in this uh, particular session in all the sessions that are happening for the seed conference this week. Uh, their role is in preparation for the needs assessment conversation that's coming up next Sunday. And as a part of it, they will be taking those notes that will detail for future priorities, opportunities, and challenges. The notes will not include any personal or identifiable information. We just want to make you aware of that and it will be provided and compiled in a narrative that will be made open to the public for comments and feedback for, for the Northeast Seed community. And if any of those UVM note takers are in this audience, they can indicate who they are by placing their names in the chat. Also, as part of the needs assessment on Sunday, uh, January 24th, we'll have a day long uh, dedicated sessions to that. We do ask that folks join us for that. Um, it will start at 10 a.m. with the session two at 2 p.m. and then 4 p.m. will be the third session. And really the needs assessment will help identify strengths and challenges and brainstorm steps necessary to build resilience in the region. It will be uh, moderated by Jackie Pilati and Hannah Tragus. And so we do invite you to uh, participate in that. You will have to register separately. And there's a link that I'm gonna mention right now that you can do that. Now. We know that there are many uh, folks that um, could not attend the conference without additional help. And we hope that some have benefited from the OREI grant that supported scholarships for the SEED conference. And our UVM collaborators have been able to offer this. We have been very grateful for that. And so we are happy to offer a selection of free access to SEED workshops and meetups. And we'll put this chat later on when I finish this link that you can use to access those free sessions. If you have any friends or family that could not register for the overall conference, but they want to come to the, the free sessions, give them the link that I'll place in the chat. And you'll also use that, seat, that same link for the needs assessment. And so now, uh, without any further from myself, I appreciate your patience with me this morning. I will turn things over to my co-moderator, Jackie Pilati, and we do hope that you enjoy this workshop. And again, thank you for joining us. So Jackie, it's all yours. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so just a couple quick things before I pass it over to Lex. Uh, this is a workshop, not a webinar. So we really would, you know, implore you to be as present as possible. Um, if you don't already, maybe want to grab some paper or writing utensil, we are going to be asking you to do some reflective work and it may be helpful to write that down. Um, and if you want to have your cameras on, it'd be great to see faces. We know that we have a lot of friends that are joining us today. And that is about it for me. So I'm going to pass it off to Lex Barlow. Okay, 
Good morning, everybody. Um, good to see y'all. I honestly cannot believe that there are 90 of you here on a Sunday morning. This is shocking, um, but I'm very happy to see every one of you. Um, thanks for being here with us. Um, I'm excited for today. Um, and as Jackie said, this is going to be a workshop. So we are here today to talk about unearthing seed stories um, from personal to practical and also obviously political. Um, we are going to share a little bit about what, um, you know, what stories are important to us, why seed stories are important to us. Um, maybe we can go to the next slide. Oh, well, I'll just say real quick. Yeah, we have Anna, who you already met. We have Jackie, who you already met myself, and then Owen, who is uh, somewhere here off camera and you'll meet more in a bit. Um, and there he is. Um, and then we are going to, um, yeah, can we go to the next slide real quick? Oops, the one, yeah, that one. So um, briefly, our agenda is, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about what, what are seed stories, why they're important, um, and we're going to, there, there. <laughs> um, um, all good. So we're going to talk about, you know, why, why these stories are important, why they're important, you know, in our communities, why they're important politically, why they're important to the literal work that we're doing with the land. Um, and um, yeah, what it looks like, some, some strategies uh, to unearth them. We'll do a little bit of practice on that with each other and we'll encourage you to do that as well in some small groups. Um, and then talk a little bit about, you know, kind of what, what the application is of this. Not, you know, yes, we can talk to each other all day about seed stories and like absolutely do that. And also, right, there's a connection to these stories and the ways that we actually um, you know, work with the land and with each other on the land and, and what our work to, you know, to produce and share seeds and, and food looks like. So we will get into that. That's what we'll be getting into today. Um, I think that we're going to send y'all into some groups to do small group introductions quickly. Um, uh, so we're going to be transitioning into breakout rooms where you're going to have an opportunity to get to know some of the folks that are joining us today a little bit more int intimately. And so we would like it if you all could share your name, your place of origin, where you're coming from, uh, whose ancestral lands you're on, you're setting an intention for why you're joining this session today, and then also sharing your connection to seed work if you are already, you know, deep in it, or if you're someone who is, you know, just kind of beginning out your journey. So I'm going to send everyone off into breakout rooms, and then we'll do a time check to let you, to give you a heads up of when we're going to come back to the main room. Yeah, so thanks for meeting each other as Jackie gets us going, and we will also, we will all introduce ourselves more. Um, and after the, after the breakout group, so this is just a little bit of let's let's get y'all speaking first using the voices, and then we'll we'll talk a little bit more after. All right. See you in a bit.
When are you gonna uh, have them in until? So I set a timer. Okay. Hope you all had a chance to connect a bit more intimately. Sorry if there was a little breakout room shuffle there. Uh, we were trying to manage folks who were still joining us um, while also assigning them to groups as they were trickling in. All right. Yes, okay. Hey, everybody. I just wanted to see your faces for a second. Um, I hope it was a good time in the groups. It's good to see all of you. Um, so I just wanted to reintroduce myself a little bit because I realized I didn't really do that. Um, my name is Lex, I use she and her pronouns. I'm on Lenape land in New York City where I was born and raised. Um, and I am, that's where I'm calling from into the virtual, into the virtual world. Um, but right now I'm pretty I'm present with all of you. Um, very excited to be in this conversation. And I guess I can, we can put back up the, the screen share now, but I just wanted to be able to see everybody and have you all see each other big for a second. Um, and as we go in today, you know, the, the four of us will be each sharing some stories and we'll be inviting y'all to share some stories. Um, and I just wanna say that, you know, these are kind of the overarching questions that are framing our time here together, which is thinking about what the inward work that we have to, to, to do to be in integrity with seeds is, as well as the outward work, um, right? And I think that, you know, uh, all of the people in who are presenters in this workshop, we can all speak for ourselves, but I'll say like part of this, right, is, is in other words, this is saying, how can we be accountable, right, to our own lineages, to the seeds, and also to each other at the same time, um, and kind of be balancing those, those three things as we are like sharing these beautiful things and sharing these beautiful things that we all know seeds to be. Um, and also want to make sure that we are doing that responsibly and, and powerfully. Um, so, you know, for our inward, inward question, um, the question is really, what are the seeds that tell your story? And that might be a really easy answer for some people, and that might be a hard answer for others. Um, and it is, regardless of whether it's easy or hard, it's definitely a journey. Um, and so we'll share a little bit about like our own journeys with those questions, as well as um, how can we build community around our seed and food work as people grounded in our own culture? And I think that question speaks for itself, but we will also get into it more. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so real quick, um, you know, we'll, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get into this and I'll also open it up to the rest of of the presenters to share on this. But, um, you know, for us, we did wanna do something where we're, we're engaging in this story work together. And that's really important to all of us um, individually. And also is, is so much of what brings, I think the four of us together as well, which is really dope. Um, but, you know, I just wanted to, to say on this, it is, it is important. Um, that as we are thinking about these, uh, thinking about these stories, we don't see them in isolation. Um, we we do love the power of telling stories to each other, and we also know that that carries a lot of weight and responsibility as well. Um, and so, it's important that we're all kind of coming from where we come from, um, and we meet each other in that place. And it's beautiful. But but it but the reason why the meeting is beautiful is because we're all grounded in where we come from, and so. I think I'll pat, uh, we can go to the next slide real quick and I'll also just open it up to Jackie, Owen and Anna as well to jump in on, on any of these things, right? Um, one of the, the things that I wanted to mention um, in particular about why, why seed stories are important um, is because, well, actually let me pass it to you first, Jackie and then I'll come back in on the, 
multinational agribusiness point. Yeah, so, um, you know, carrying off on what Lex is saying, you know, we really wanted to have folks go through an exercise of what it is to to do this inward work and, and think about how that informs the work that we do, whether it's professionally, whether it's something that it comes just from a place of love and passion. And so we brainstorm some, some whys, right? So maybe you're keeping seeds because you're keeping culture. Maybe it's about a historical narrative. Maybe it's about, you know, celebrating land races and genetic resilience that certain varieties have. Maybe these are seeds that ground you to a particular place or a particular people. And it's about a, a personal journey celebrating a, a family history or a family legacy. Or maybe it's about, you know, an act of disruption and resistance against our globalized seed agribusiness and how seed has become consolidated and privatized and controlled because of so much intentional disconnection. Yeah, to jump in on that. Um, I think it's really important for all of us that the conversations were, right, we, we, have, we have an understanding about the political power of seeds and the political power of um, telling stories around seeds, right? And, and so what, as Jackie said, what we understand is that part of the reason why seeds have been able to be privatized and part of the reason why seeds have been able to be um, controlled by these forces that are so, so far away from our people, right? Is because we have been able to be disconnected from them. Um, and it is because we have been able to you know, these, these corporate forces have been really effective at distancing people from their seeds and from, from their, obviously their land um, as well. And, and ironically, you know, grabbing land in order to produce more seeds that are more disconnected from us, that disconnect us from our land further and that cycle goes on and on. Um, but so when we say these things to each other and when we, when we tell these stories, we know that what we're doing is actively piecing this back together, right? After it has been intentionally broken apart. Um, Owen, do you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think it's, for me, it's always helpful to think of how I came to thinking of seeds as embodying culture and stories, you know, having grown up working in a nursery as a teenager, you know, looking at the seed packets on the racks and not having a familial or cultural relationship that I was aware of to these plants um, is, was, is very different than the way I relate to seeds now as ancestral and as culturally important as these storied embodiments of, of culture that come from around the world. Um, you know, and it, I trace a lot of it to having been invited to a primarily Black Seed Keepers Collective that had been inspired by the Indigenous Farming Conference on Anishinaabe land at White Earth where elders in the, at that conference who were present, Anishinaabe elders had shared their practice of seed keeping as they understood it as a cultural act, as an act of holding onto traditions, onto stories, onto recipes and saying, okay, you know, why don't you go out and do this in your own communities? And this group here on the Mid-Atlantic came together kind of inspired by Bl Blaine Snipstall, a farmer in M Maryland to do something similar. And so it's not like suddenly I came into seed keeping. It was really because of that invitation and that framework. Um, so tracing it back to this kind of concept of seed keeping as inseparable from culture, cultural work. Um, very, you know, different from this idea of seeds as commodities on the rack, but instead seeds as family um, and seeds as holders of culture. And so it's just a paradigm shift, um, something that felt very immediately familiar because you can imagine, you know, our, my ancestors in Southern Italy and Western Ireland, there were varieties in the family for generations um, that were inseparable from the family. Um, and so it was an easy way to shift in and in an awesome way to shift my relationship to food, having come from the food justice movement for, you know, a couple of decades before where we talk about growing affordable, accessible, and also culturally relevant foods, it was an aha moment. Um, and so in a lot of ways, it's a paradigm shift that's necessary to bring us away from 
a commodification of our foods that has separated us from our foods and from our land and from our culture. And I guess I'll say one other quick thing. The, the, I think the bottom, you know, moved from archival to intentional. You know, I worked in a seed bank basically at a private seed collection, Roughwood Seed Collection for four years that has 4,000 varieties of seeds from around the world. And it was so cool to meet seeds from all different cultures, all different regions. It was fascinating to archive these varieties. Um, but the idea of people growing their own seeds and holding their own stories is was so powerful as well. And I'll talk about that a little later. But what does it mean to move from kind of collect, a collecting mindset to one of stewarding our own stories and our own and our own crops. Yeah, thank you for that, Ellen. Um, Jackie, you want to add, add something? So I think you know overall, given just some of the these kind of intentions that that we've thrown out, and some of them may some of them may resonate with you, or some you know yours might be very different or something that you're still figuring out. But the, the thing that we wanted to keep coming back to is this idea that, you know, given in any relationship that you enter into, if you don't have a good sense of who you are and a good sense of self and coming from a place of love and trust, it's very difficult to enter into a relationship with an other being and, you know, do that successfully and authentically. And so that's really no different when we talk about our seed work and the work that we're doing, whether you're growing food for yourself, for market, um, or a contract grower, et cetera. Um, you know, all of these things are layered in these relationships that we build. And so doing this inward work is really important to set this, this foundation as you move forward. So, that is, you know, what we will be asking of you all. And so therefore is also what we're asking of each other. Um, and so we're going to share a little bit um, and we're going to share just, you know, to say the question, what are the seeds that tell your stories and how do we unearth these stories? Um, we are going to uh, practice a little bit with each other, um, what that looks like. And really, um, I think there's many different strategies, I guess you could say, to like, what does it look like to actually unearth your own stories, to connect people in community with their own stories? Um, but the most, the most simple answer to that really is, is to be asking questions um, and to be asking questions, to be open and to be wanting to learn from, from each other's stories, um, I think is a powerful way to also embrace your own. So, um, yeah, the question, is, the question that I, you know, want to pose to Owen, Jackie, and Anna as well is, what are the seeds that tell your stories? Um, and and in, in, in other words, um, what plant foods were important to you in your childhood? Which ones are important to your family? Which ones um, might you, you know, not not be able to like hold in hand now, but you know, we're, we're important in, in even a family story that you might not necessarily know now. Um, where do you come from, right? What, what are the plants that you come from? Um, and also, you know, and I'll say this, like I'm a New Yorker born and raised. My family has been in New York City for five generations and I can still answer that question, you know? Um, and I think a lot of us feel sometimes like is that's just question is really far away from us and for whatever reason, whether you are a grower and you just don't know those stories or what, um, but you know, we believe that you can't answer that question and we're gonna do a little bit of experimentation and showing how we, how we answer that question. So Anna, are you, are you there and ready to share? Sure, sure. I, I'll give it, I'll go a, a little quickly because I'm new to the seed keeping, seed saving world um, and just in growing in general, my mom is like the consummate gardener. And so I would watch her with seeds growing up, her and my father, may Allah be pleased with them. And growing up in California, you know, you have tempered weather in San Diego. And so they had, you know, they would grow amazing tomatoes and peppers. And I was always trying to figure out what's up with these hot peppers, hot peppers and everything. But there was such a medicinal value to it that it was something that both families did. Um, my mom would talk about all the time how growing up in Savannah, they would actually uh, grow things together in their gardens. 
and come together and can. And her role as a little girl was to prepare the, the uh, string beans. So she'd get prime real estate to prep the beans and to hear all the juicy gossip uh, until they realized she was in the room and she got evicted <laughs> and had to go someplace else. But, you know, just hearing her talk about that really was what growing food was about, was sharing and um, strengthening each other because it was right at the heart uh, of Jim Crow. Things were, were harsh um, for, for Black people, particularly growing up in the South. So they did everything together. And that's what really made their community strong. And I find that I'm trying to duplicate that here in Springfield. You're looking at pictures of amazing group of youth leaders that I have the honor of working with in Springfield. And I say honor because I learned from them probably more than what I could ever give. And when we start talking about gardening and growing food, I really try to, to um, put it in a way, because you know, when you're talking to young people, you got to kind of back into it, you got to make it fun for them. So we always look at, well, what, what is it that grandma makes that you just really like, that you would love to bring her some, some wonderful vegetables that you grew for her? What's that thing that TT makes that you just really, really, really want her to make again for you? And so that's when um, the ideas start flowing about, oh yeah, you know, my mom, she makes sancocho or our neighbor makes wonderful sofrito or someone makes this excellent collard greens. Um, in the children's garden club, we had a little girl who we called the Kalalu queen. And she let us know that her grandmother makes the best Kalalu ever. <laughs> and that's exactly how she said it. But what was even more amazing is that she took her time to show us how we harvest the Kalalu, how it's prepped. She took it home, talked to grandmother into making some and brought it back and taught us about the importance how Kalalu was really a center of their family, if you will, because everyone could make it. And so for me, it's that building of community. And when I look back just at my own very brief seed stories, you know, when my mom gives me these seeds from her prized cayenne pepper, and knowing that cayenne is a big part of our medicinal preparations that I still do. Um, or she um, gives me a prized tomato and she grows this beautiful indigo tomato. And um, her and my neighbor, may Allah be pleased with her, Mrs. Brown, every year they took pride in this tomato. Uh, and for her to share those seeds with me and, and have me try to duplicate that up here, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. So again, I'm very new to the seed world, but just that building of community, tying closer to family, to ancestors and the stories that those seeds bring and being and watching the youth leaders now duplicate that, it, it's an amazing thing. Thank you, Anna. Um, oh, this is my page. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, what is on here? Um, so you'll see um, here, okay, so I guess for me, um, I have spent, um, I have spent the last few years um, reconnecting with some of the, of the foods that are most important to me and um, also working with um, medicines and, and medicinal plants as well and trying to, understand how I can be the person that I am many generations later carrying and caring about some of the seeds that were important to my ancestors. So um, here you'll see uh, some black eyed peas on the top. This is um, some black eyed peas that um, a friend grew in North Carolina. And then in the center, there's a Holstein black eyed pea, which actually um, Jackie and I, so Jackie grew the seeds that you see in the green bowl. Owen gave Jackie and I the seeds like a year before that. And the photo below that is my, so the top photo is Jackie's next generation. And the bottom photo is my next generation um, of the same seed that Owen um, gave to us the year before. And so that's, that's, it's sweet that, you know, we are out here really actually like, cool, the point of us sharing seeds with each other is exactly this, right? Not only that we, um, that we grow them ourselves and eat them ourselves, but that, that, that act of sharing and the ways that we're connected is something that helps me connect more deeply with myself, right? And my family. And um, the top photo is the preparation that my mom and I did to cook these black eyed peas on New Year's. 
Day, which is obviously a very long and important tradition in Black communities in the United States. So to be able to bring like actually this amount of, um, you know, seeds to my mom was, was a huge gift. Um, and it's honestly, it's honestly really hard to put into words um, what, what it feels like to, to actually know that, that, you know, we, we in so many ways arrived here. Um, the Black Eyed Pea is especially important to, to me because, right, because it carry, it carries so many generations together. And also to be able to share this with my mom, who is a Black woman who grew up in New York City, who literally had never held Black Eyed Peas that were grown by anyone that she was even remotely connected to before, um, but had like made them every single year of her life. And so we're, we're working both forwards and backwards as we do this healing work with our lineage. Um, and especially I'll say as well, like, you know, my mom represents, I think, a generation that has a, ha carries a lot of trauma around the land and carries a lot of um, resistance to things that are grown in the land as well, um, which is true for a lot of Black women like her age. And, and so it's, yeah, we, we are on this journey together. And, and I, will, I will also share, you know, about the, I could go on and on about the cotton on the bottom, and I unfortunately don't have enough time to do that. But um, this is, you know, there's a little, there's a little baggie that contains gandules and cotton and the gandules are from, grown from Puerto Rico. Um, and the cotton is grown here in Harlem, New York City. Um, and I will just say I'm not Puerto Rican, but, um, have, have had the, like, immense blessing to spend a lot of time there and get to know farmers there as well. And to be able to connect with something like the gandul or the pea or the pigeon pea, um, uh, which is an African, you know, which came to Puerto Rico from Africa and is also in Caribbean African lineages that my family is a part of as well. Um, but it's something that I'm not directly connected to in the sense that like what the gandul is in Puerto Rico is like very, very important and, and has a cultural value that it doesn't for me in the same way. Um, so part of the seed work and part of um, what it looks like for me to be in seed stories, right? And I think we are all in the practice of this with each other, as I said about Owen sharing the seeds with us, um, is that we like, so we so we so intentionally care for the one, the seeds that are important to us and also do our best to pass them on rightfully to other people who we know also will care for them um, and particularly who whose ancestors did so as well. And so that is that has been part of the work, right? This is a little baggie that I prepared for a friend um, who is Puerto Rican, who's a New Yorkian. Um, so I'm able to like kind of reconnect them with these seeds that are important to them and their, their ancestors' lands, as well as um, share this Northern regionally adapted cotton, which grew in New York City, which I'm just completely obsessed with. And that's a whole other story. And if you're interested, please talk to me about it. Um, and if you're very, very, like very sure that you will care for, for these seeds and you're a black person, I will happily share you some of these. There's very few, but I will happily share them. Um, and yeah, and just to say, you know, the, the photo on the left really quick is, uh, a photo from doing some seed saving work in a community garden here in Brooklyn. Um, this is like, um, this is often what the tables look like when we are, um, you know, just introducing people back to, to the things that are already known by their bodies and their hands and they're through their ancestors, but just kind of, you know, bringing this skill back of seed saving and, and all the ways that it looks like. So that is also for me been a very important part of, of sharing story and being in, in my own story. And, you know, sometimes it is, okay, this very specific plant and this very specific crop for this reason. And sometimes it is actually, it's all of these plants because we just need to get our hands on and learn together and like figure out how all of our different connections work. And so just wanna, you know, on the one hand, yes, like bring in that focus on what is most important to me and my lineage and also say, right, take a little pressure off to say like, that's not to say that we shouldn't be learning and sharing and caring for seeds that are not quote unquote ours or not quote unquote of our people, right? But we we in be in being most grounded in my own in my own seed stories that are important to me. It helps me do that more broadly. So that that's all I'll share for now. I know I already went over time, but um, I'll pass it to the next slide. So thank you, Lex. Um, so kind of carrying off this theme, I think that Lex surfaced for us is 
not only the seeds themselves, but the process. And so in my seed keeping work, um, it's kind of become not only about the actual, the foods, right? And reconnecting to that in a deeper way, but it's also been about trying to facilitate this process of reconciliation, um, also coming from ancestors who were farming and have traumatic relationships related to land and land-based practices. And, um, you know, when my parents found out that I had shifted from being a science teacher to like teaching in gardens and working and coming home covered in soil, they were like, what? why like we you know we left that like what are you doing why are you going back to that so also trying to embark in this healing process right and so what you're seeing are some of the things that i've grown seeds and and foods that i'm connected to and so on the left there there are the um ahi dulce peppers that we use to make sofrito which anna mentioned before um, to the right, there are gandules, um, and this is a beautiful photo that Owen took. And so the gandules are, as Lex mentioned, very um, important crop, important food in Puerto Rican cooking. Um, they are traditionally used in a dish that is made on around Christmas time, and that kind of coincides with the harvest times um, in Puerto Rico. And so interesting for me, uh, I had initially tried to grow gandules and I had seeds sent from family up here and I was growing them in Queens and the plants grew. There was a lot of, you know, biomass, but nothing ever flowered. And that's because, you know, these were seeds that were coming directly from Puerto Rico. They're a, a daylink sensitive plant. And so I was able har to harvest anything that year. And I had gone to a NOFA summer conference and ended up connecting to a friend, Jeremy, who is the one of the farm farmers at East New York Farms in Brooklyn. And there was a, a seed share uh, at the end of a session that we did with Rowan White. And Jeremy was like, oh, you know, I have these gandules. We just, we grew them in, in East New York. And I was like, what? You have adapted, you know, gandules? Like, how could this be? You know, it's just so serendipitous. And so from there, that became um, the way that I was able to grow and harvest and, you know, having this beautiful moment with my mother of harvesting gandules together and making rice with them um, was just like a full circle moment for me. And so at the very bottom there, you see some fava beans. I love to grow fava beans. Um, because we eat lots of fava beans. And, you know, also being Sicilian, fava beans are, you know, very significant to us. My mother learned to make a soup with fava beans that I grew up eating. And um, so growing them every year, not only as a great um, nitrogen fixing crop, but, you know, just to have, you know, beautiful fava flowers and, and being able to harvest these beans together to make the soup. Um, is beautiful and it's something now that I do with my son. So it kind of shows, you know, how these traditions and practices can be passed down from year after year. So I'm gonna pass it over to Owen. Thanks, well, I wanna just say thank you for inviting me to be part of this conversation. I'm glad to be with you all right now. Um, and thanks for making this slide for me. Uh, I will talk about these plants. <clears throat> I, and I'm going to start with the seed story. I had to come up with all these other things I was going to say, but I'm just going to round it in the seed story. Um, while I was working at Roughwood Seed Collection um, from 2013 to 17 for four years, four seasons, um, like I said, we grew thousands. I don't remember if I said this in the small groups or the big group, but we grew thousands of varieties um, of seeds from around the world. Um, and it was fascinating to meet so many plants I'd never seen before, learn about all of these stories. But what happened when I started growing the lumper potato and Dr. Weaver, who I worked with, explained to me that this was the potato that was being grown in Ireland throughout the 1800s and particularly during the great hunger. Um, it just became a very profound experience for me, um, knowing that my great grandmother 
uh, you know, most of a lot, a disproportionate number, I don't know if that's the right word, but most of my ancestors are Irish. I'm also Southern Italian and a bunch of other things. But knowing specifically that my great grandmother, Mary Lenahan, grew up on a potato farm and cabbage farm and on the Bay of Galway, where they would fish, um, growing this crop and knowing, oh, this is probably the potato they grew when her family experienced the great hunger, suddenly having been a lifelong food grower since I was a little kid with my own garden until now, suddenly grow the growing of a crop became so much deeper and more personal as I literally unearthed this seed story um, with my hands from the dirt. And now every year growing the lump of potato is a time where I connect with the great grandmother that I never got to meet, um, but whose life story I was very familiar with growing up in a you know, thatched roof shack in Western Ireland with a huge family. Um, and so having worked in the food justice movement for, you know, at that point, about 10, maybe 15 years, where my job was to be in community gardens, especially in New York City, um, learning about Kalaloo, learning about collard greens, learning about everybody's food um, crops besides my own. Um, being this white kid from, you know, rural Connecticut, um, where it was my job to support community gardeners and farmers and understand why they grew the crops that they grew. Suddenly I had a food story and it was um, really powerful, especially because, you know, my partner is black from the Mississippi Delta. Um, my family, my community is so super multiracial and people have often said like, what are you bringing to the table? You know, what is your story? A lot of people will come, a lot of white people will come kind of, and I grew up thinking this, that, oh, I have no culture because my ancestors, my Italian and Irish um, ancestors came to this country and it, you know, they wanted to assimilate as quickly as possible, lose their language, lose their religion, lose their food cultures. So they no longer stood out. Um, and, you know, they didn't experience the same oppression as people of color in this country, but they were discriminated against. And so in, in losing their traditions, they were able to blend into whiteness. And so in the relearning of these seed stories, I'm starting to reconnect with the cultures that that my ancestors left behind. And in doing so, my hope is to challenge the creation of the myth of whiteness in this country. We actually come from somewhere we do come from a culture. And so the growing of the lumper every time when I plant it and every time when I harvest it, I meditate and, and you know, pray for my, my great grandmother and all of her ancestors who were fed by this crop. Of course, it's an Andean crop. It's not indigenous to Ireland, but this was a crop that was responsible for the survival and then the death and, and migration of so many of my ancestors. Um, real quick on the, the burlato beans over there. Um, you know, I'm originally from Mohegan land and I, um, recon I connected with a, a Mohegan sister, um, Rachel Sayet, and gave her one of my calendars that I make where we tell seed stories. Um, and there was a page on the lima bean and how Wampanoag people make succotash. And she said, you know, we make it too. Here's my great uncle Harold Pantaquidgen's succotash recipe. And it had this particular bean mentioned in it. And I was thinking that's really interesting because it's, it's often thought of as an Italian bean. Um, and so I looked into it and started growing it and learned later, you know, while talking, um, doing a talk at the Mohegan tribe that the reason this was so present in some of the Mohegan recipes was that the proximity of Southern Italian immigrants to the Mohegan tribe. Um, so it made sense in a lot of ways that my Southern Italian ancestors moved to Southern Connecticut, um, just like the farmers that at that point her great uncle and her family was buying these beans for. And so now the growing of this bean for me is a way to reconnect to the culture one of the, the food, important foods of Southern Italy, but also the story of it coming to Southern Connecticut and then the mixing of kind of food cultures once it got there. Um, so this was the moment for me is finding my food stories in a way that I could enter the work of food justice in a more um, kind of grounded place where I'm able to come to the table, you know, the multiracial table and say, okay, here's, here's who my people are and here's what my food is. We may have skipped a couple generations, but I'm reclaiming it now and I'm building community with those people now. 
in order to under my, understand myself and where we come from um, a little bit better. You know, hand in hand with that, and I'll end with this, is being, being part of that seed collection, the Rookwood Seed Collection, with seeds from all over the world. Um, and then being able to say to a friend from Baltimore, you know, for example, Xavier, or from Washington, D.C., who worked with Black farmers in Baltimore and D.C., um, here's this fish pepper from Horace Pippin. It comes from the catering communities of Baltimore and Philadelphia. Um, and have him take it and develop a product, a, a, a pepper sauce product based on that and have it be grown by a huge network of Black farmers in that region. It was an act of rematriation. Um, finding indigenous seeds within the, the collection I was managing and sending them back to Mohegan or back to Lenape or back to um, Haudenosaunee. Um, that was an act of rematriation and suddenly gave these seeds with their stories back to the original keepers of these stories. Um, and for me, that's, that's some of the most powerful parts of this work. And so with True Love Seeds, the farmers that grow for our catalog, everybody grows their ancestral seeds for our catalog. Everyone at our farm grows our ancestral seeds for the catalog and we tell our own stories. So for us, the telling of the story is important to have that live within those people who embody that story and who come from that story. Um, and I know Jackie mentioned when inviting me, um, she wanted me to mention our podcast and we started a Seeds in Their People podcast as a way to further get closer to people telling their own story. So hearing with, from people's own voice, their own story about their own seeds. And so these are some of the ways that we, that we try to do that. Thank you, Owen and everybody um, for sharing. Um, I know that all of us are really just scratching the surface. Um, there's so much to each of these stories, but um, that's just a taste. We are gonna send uh, the we're gonna send you into small groups again. Um, and this is gonna be an opportunity, you know, so originally, I also definitely encourage like if you like to journal or good like want a moment of reflection in life, um, this is a good question to kind of meditate on. Um, and you know, we also and we're happy to talk more about all this as well when we come back from the groups, but there's there's lots of different ways um, beyond just asking questions um, to to learn these stories, but um, each of us, I think, shared a little bit about what that can look like. Um, so we're going to send you into groups um, to discuss this question with each other. And I think if we go to the next slide to just practice, yeah, to just kind of apply and practice, okay, um, what does it look like to, to do this with yourself and with others? Um, and if you feel already connected, you know, what, what does the connection of seed and story to spirit look like for you? Um, you know, for, for each of us, such a different journey, but also all, all sibling journeys together on, on this path. So we would love to have y'all also get into um, thinking about that with each other. So I'm gonna send you all into rooms uh, for about the next 10 minutes. I will copy these questions or these prompts out, you know, broadcast it out to the group so you have it for reference. And then when folks come back, um, for those of you who would like to share with the main group, we'd love to hear some of these stories or things that resonated or you know new, new um, inspirations that have come out. And then we'll have some time for Q&A at the very end. All right, so see you all in a bit.
you 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 already hit it to bring them back yeah so some of the folks everybody really... everybody's having good conversation yeah they don't want to leave the room they don't want to leave the room that's how you know sometimes people be hitting that like back button right away and you're like oh okay i guess it wasn't like that in the group <laughs> like <laughs> so it's a good sign i think when they don't come back until the very last minute <laughs> are actually listening to each other. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, looks like, seems like y'all were probably in the middle of it. Um, so I'm glad for that. And I'm glad for their, not for, you know, there's always enough time, but also that it's a good sign that y'all want to talk more um hard to do the yeah definitely the amount of time that we have to work with is is a challenge as i said like we know that in so many ways we're just scratching the surface with these conversations but hopefully it is a starting point or another starting point if you're already on on whatever journey you're on definitely so i think we just want to um you know, we, we have a couple of questions that we want to offer, but we also just want to open it up and see if anybody wants to share something that came up in your group. Um, any reflections that you want to bring back for others to learn from or hear. I could share again. I was just so moved. I'm so excited because I'm sitting here in this conference and um, like I was telling my group, I was in group two, that um, I, I was on a panel with Gullah Geechee, uh, Queen Quet, and um, this was year, two years ago, three years ago maybe, and it wasn't until today when I'm sitting here looking at you all seeds and, you know, hearing this conversation that I realized the woman gave me seeds. I, I didn't, I'm holding on to this artifact or whatever. I don't know what it was going on with me. I still got the bowl. I can't plant the bowl. But why haven't I taken the time to plant the seeds? So I just thought that that was so cool about today for me, being able to say that this woman gave me life and I'm sitting here on death mode. Um, thanks. Mm. Yes, thank you. Thank you for sharing. How about some other folks? What are some new connections, things that, that came up for you? Feel free to unmute yourself. Um, Susan was selling a story and she got cut off in her group. I really wanted to hear her seed story. Well, it wasn't, it wasn't quite a seed story. It was more of a plant origin story. And that is that I was raised by an Italian stepmother and I remember her, her father growing tomatoes, you know, with simple wooden stakes and, and ripping bed sheets to tie the tomato to the steak. And so years later, had to I meet my, my life partner and he, he has Italian and Polish background and he remembers his parents doing exactly the same thing. So it was just such a wonderful feeling of continuity because we, we practice that now. <laughs> and it, you know, there are so many ways to grow a tomato, but uh, just doing it this way, it feels like it's in some way honoring this lineage that you know we've been impacted by and are from. Thank you, Susan. That was great. And again, you know, apologies for you know we're trying to do the most with the least amount of time. And so you know we really love that you all were able to connect and have vibrant conversation. And you know if you want to continue to bring that out here for everyone, we'd love to hear more. Thank you, Susan. I'm on a search for a watermelon seed. Uh, I heard the story in my family about um, after slavery, the, they were very successful farmers. I was taught that farmers were the smartest and the greatest people on earth. They knew everything. Um, and I've been on the quest for this watermelon 
uh, that my family planted that allowed them to be financially successful so they did not have to share crop. They could support the entire family uh, off the proceeds of this one delicious watermelon from Winsboro, South Carolina. So I've actually made 10 calls to my cousins trying to find it, uh, what that watermelon was. Uh, and I am still on the quest. I haven't got any answers yet, but I'm tracking down all the old folks to see if I can find it. I did find a string bean uh, and, a, and a, a mustard green, but I haven't found that great watermelon. Renetta, if you have, um, if you have, if you don't find it, uh, check with us at Seed Savers Exchange. We might have something in the collection that someone named something differently, or might we might be able to trace back a connection. Thank you, Heather. I'll do that. I'm wondering too. Chris Hubbard is a seed saver in Appalachia, and he has thousands and thousands of. Um, varieties of seeds that he's collected. And he is someone you could reach on Facebook. His, um, you spell his name K-R-I-S. And he might just, you never know what he has in his collection, but he might just have that seed. Thank you, Jackie, <laughs> for putting that in the chat. She wrote his name down. Yeah, there's something, I just feel called to share something um, about that's related to this, which is uh, the idea of you know, I think many of us, many of us spoke about um, ways that we are now reconnecting with things that are part of our families that there might have been disconnection. Um, and, you know, you're talking about as well this watermelon seed and I just want to um, name as well. And this is my experience, you know, being someone who's a descendant of enslaved black people in the United States. Um, that I, I have spent a lot of time thinking as well about disconnection and being a New Yorker and a Northerner and all of these things. And there's also so many farmers, there's so many black farmers who actually never lost that connection. And that's really important. Um, there's folks who have been on the land since day one who actually never left and who are the stewards of so many of these things that we're now like, I can't find this anywhere. And it's actually not special to them because they've been growing it for like 50, 100 years and it's just the thing that they do every year, right? And so to also name that like the people that we call seed keepers, um, oftentimes in the places that are like mo more disconnected from the land, right? So many of our ancestors and just our elders and people who are on the land now are also those people who are stewarding varieties casually and like are just, you know, kind of doing that in family and in community with each other. And so we also, you know, I just wanna, I just wanna name, right? That like this, this disconnection and the connection looks different for everybody and that within our families and within our extended families as well, right? Like all of this is still here. Um, we actually haven't lost it. And so I know that watermelon seed is somewhere waiting for you to find it because <laughs> someone else is still connected to it. You know, it's yeah. not, it has not been lost. Mm -hmm. um, other thoughts on this? I just wanna also say, so officially our session is supposed to end at 11.30, obviously that's very soon. Um, Anna has let us know that we don't have to leave the Zoom room exactly at 11.30 on the dot. So I know that myself and, and maybe some of our other presenters can, can hang around for a little bit and talk. Um, so just know that, know that. Um, but I also want to take this moment to, yeah, ask if there's any other thoughts or also invite questions as well that people want to ask of us or just of the group in general. I also want to throw out there, Lex, um, you know, Owen mentioned his wonderful podcast and the episode that he did with his partner is like one of my favorites. Um, it's great. Check it out if, if you haven't. But um, we were also kind of talking about if you're already doing this work, what are the ways that you capture these stories? Um, so like a podcast is one, right? Um, or is it, are there photos? Is it about writing it down on a seed packet? You know, um, for the folks that are doing this, what are the, the kind of outputs, I guess, or like, you know, how do you preserve them and capture them? Because the, in the way that you do it might inspire someone else. I find myself all the time um, 
with people being so fascinated and me not really always wanting to regurgitate everything, I find myself um, as a, in my opinion, a great videographer and photographer um, by just showing people the way, exposing like new terminology that I might come up with, might be quirky or that I'm learning, like let's say here or somewhere else, um, just, you know, slowly introduce those things, like overuse those words, um, try to be as simplistic as possible. But I think that my route is videography and photography journaling. And then posting will show you a story. I love that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Hey, uh, I'm Robert. Uh, I live uh, down in the Finger Lakes here, south of the Onondaga Nation. And uh, I, I struggle with my uh, my place here. I'm, I feel like I'm uh, part of a uh, canceled culture. Uh, my ancestors came here in 1794. Uh, their firstborn child uh, read in a newspaper article from the 30s here the other day. Uh, telling about the old Albert homestead being the original house being sold. And uh, Sylvester was born in 1795. And uh, it said he was the, the first white child born in the region. And it just, uh, you know, we've, we've had a farm here for a couple hundred years and, uh, you know, military lot for being in the Revolutionary War. And, and you know, you just, uh, you just feel like, yeah, we've got all this, this history here, but it, it's just like we just stopped somebody else's culture, you know, literally dead in its tracks. And, and it's just uh, um, a hard legacy to, to deal with it in these times. And uh, I uh, was part of the uh, Witness Injustice uh, project yesterday, and it just... Uh, um, we got a lot of work ahead of us. Or, I, I'm an old man now, but I say you all have a lot of work ahead of you. And uh, I, I really uh, uh, been part of NOFA for a long time. And I'm just so, so uh, humbled by the work that you, you do with the seed project. We, we were in person two years ago in Saratoga. And, uh, you know, how much has evolved and developed from that uh, you, you all have a amazing work ahead of you and I, and I am humbled by it. Thank you. Can I, can I say, well, thank you for sharing, first of all. And I think the ability to name, you know, the truth of our ancestors history is a very powerful thing within a, a anti-racist co uh, context. Um, like we can own where we come from and, and try to understand it and the, the ability to share it in a group of people who are grappling with a complicated and violent history is, is a very powerful thing. Um, so I just want to appreciate you for, for bringing that up in the way that you did. So in that, we still grow a lot of corn here. I, I uh, got these old uh, seed saver racks that I uh, save my corn on. Um, but uh, it does go back hard and long. Uh, I've got a sign here. It was stuck up in the barn from uh, from uh, 1809, they used to have a, uh, a tavern, a tavern on the farm, and um, my my family all became uh, uh, women's temperance uh, suffragists and missionaries, and uh, that's another story. Uh, but um, I just I just am so so uh, thrilled at the work you all do, and and that NOFA can be any part of that platform. Uh, moving forward is is uh, it's been a great partnership, and I, I really uh, admire you all for uh, keeping it keeping it keeping it real. You know, uh, especially in these troubled times. Thank you. I wanted to mention one other way um, of sharing seed stories that I've really enjoyed, um, be besides what's been mentioned, and um, one is we we do a lot of seed swaps here. I, I, I run a seed exchange in Philadelphia where we have people come and swap seeds for free at the libraries mostly. And we try to start them out with people kind of circling up and telling the stories of the seeds that they brought. And sometimes the stories 
started with that person. Sometimes they go pretty far back. And either way, it's a really powerful way for people to get to know who's in the room and what seeds are in the room um, and to get into the practice of kind of the oral tradition of storytelling through seeds. And so on our breakout group, several people talked about their seed libraries and seed giveaways. And I just wanted to offer that up as one of our practices of a way to pass on stories through seeds. This is Shannon, I'd like to introduce my daughter, Melissa, who is in, sitting next to me here. Yeah, sorry, we don't have a camera on this computer. <laughs> we'll, 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 we'll have one for the next. But, um, but thank you all for sharing these stories. Uh, it's so powerful to hear. And, um, and one you know, big question we have, and I know this is a bigger conversation, um, and, and we're not asking for the energy suck that it can sometimes take to have this conversation, but I'm curious, you know, how do we as two white women support BIPOC seed stories, you know, and, and how do we grow and save seeds without appropriating those stories? Is that even possible? And in general, how can we be better allies? So you wanna you want you wanna answer to what you just asked? Well, shit, let's get it popping. Everybody wanna be quiet. You wanna know how to be a better ally? Recognize your whiteness and use it. Facts. And then philanthropically, quit going into neighborhoods if this is something you do or you know some people. Call some people out. Don't call them in. Call them out. <laughs> Shit, the quit, quit, all this behind the scene. I really wish that we could X, Y, no, do it, like say it, like be verbal and call people out. But philanthropically, I'm tired of dealing with organizations or white women who get in spaces and want to challenge why, why the culture wants to do what they want to do. Because it doesn't make sense to you. You know what I'm saying? You don't move forward with stuff. And I, I don't appreciate that because I'm with my people and I'm telling you what my people would respond to. So therefore I'm an expert at this because you brought me to the table. But a lot of times organizations are brought in and then they don't respect the people that were already doing it. So they are, they're kind of shunned and you're, you're receiving backlash even though you know it might be innocent when you go to initiate or work with or partner. But partner to me, I think that's a bad term. I think like that's like being a hoe. If you want to partner with everybody, what are you laying in bed with everybody for? You know, have a specific reason that you're there or wh whoever you're working with. Expect and know that you have privilege. Use that privilege, call people out and give guidance to where people can go. That's my, my, my spill on it. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I jumping in. I... I would like to bring up. Um, I would like to bring up the the land and the finances and the resources. I think that there's a lot that we can talk about about how to talk, you know. Um, and at the end of the day, the talk is cheap without without the the means to actually support oneself um, and connect with. The only way that people can really connect with their seeds is by actually having a place to grow them. Um, and so without talking about land redistribution and, and reparations and in that way, um, it's a little bit hard to actually be concrete, right, about, about all the rest. Um, so if you're sitting on land, consider um, redistributing, consider sharing, consider whatever arrangement, consider giving um, fully, um, consider all of those things. Um, I'll also say like, if you, um, you know, if you have seeds that you know are connected to to uh, certain people, um, do the do the relationship work that's necessary to actually return those in a way that that is real. Um, I think that that can be nerve wracking and that can be scary and that can be all types of things, um, but it's worth it. And um, I think the other, you know, the other thing, this is, this is yes land, but this is also um, finances. I was, I think Jackie and I, Jackie and I'd be talking about this all the time, but basically like, I don't know a single farm or land project or seed project or anything run by a black person, indigenous person or person of color that like 
doesn't already know exactly what they're doing and like just if they got if they got like more resources could could grow exponentially like so i think that there's there's often this idea that um you know we need to like talk more about x y and z or whatever and a lot of times like black folks like people we already know like what's good it's just like ten thousand more dollars could change the game of like this whole thing i'm like I'm like, if someone on this call wants to get Jackie paid so that like Jackie can dedicate herself to this work, like, and but I'm serious, you know, like this is, there's so much already here that just needs to be resourced. Um, so I just want to encourage folks to, to really be going and to really be pushing themselves and thinking on that. I'm sure there's other things people want to add. I, if I can just jump in real quick on that, because that is something um, we face a lot. And it is, look, I told someone one time, if I have $15,000, I can just make this happen with no issue. Really, we, we are not looking for the great white hope syndrome. We don't need that. Um, it's resources, it's land, it is, look, there, it is finances. I just have to be real like that and not do it in drips and drabs, which a lot of funders do. And it's, uh, it's just, oh goodness, it's a pain. Uh, we're tap dancing for a little bit here, a little bit there. No, give it up. I don't mean to make it sound so harsh, but just give it up. Um, if you want to be that ally, it's the resources. So I'll, I'll leave that very quickly. I just, yeah, I sorry. think, sorry. Um, I think it's just really, if you think about it in terms of like food security and food sovereignty, like one is going to have you waiting online at a food pantry independent on SNAP benefits. And the other one is about you self-determining what that looks like for you and your community. So, you know, that that's kind of like the movement of where the work is at its most successful and, and how it can be realized and impactful in those ways. Um, so, so figuring out and that's kind of, you know, circling back to a lot of the things we talked about. It's a, like understanding what your lane is, staying in your lane, but then also understanding how you work as accomplices and allies with other groups. And again, going back to relationships, it's all about relationships. And that starts with you. Francis, did you have something to say? Yes, Francis, tell us. No, I, everyone is saying everything and thank you for that. I just, um, I feel like there are, there seem to be um, a, a decent amount of, of white folks who are doing, doing the, the work in the right way. And I think other white folks who have questions need to just beeline straight to those white folks. And, and, you know, I'm looking at Owen, I don't mean to just put everything on Owen, but Owen is the first white man I met who was really about this seed life. And I have learned so much from Owen. So I just encourage um, other white folks to not just give, you know, I don't think Owen needs all the work, but I know that Owen is connected to other white folks who are also doing the work in the right ways. So um, I don't ever want to hear questions like that ever again, which is why I was quiet. I just feel like, to, you know, if you have those questions, take that right directly to the white folks who are doing that work so that they could lead the way. And then the short answer is, yeah, like drop the money. It's not, it's really no mystery. Like we need funding for the work that we're very, very clear on. It's, it's as simple as that, so yeah. I'd love to say a couple things too, since you kind of invited me into that space. Um, thank you. I, you know, it's interesting. I went through this, this program, um, you know, I have a lot of critiques of the endless anti-racist programs, but I did go through this one anti-racist program where we had to practice fundraising um because the first thing that we did was look at okay people talk about white privilege and you can name all the ways and they're real but one of those things is we have had generational wealth accumulation it may not look like that in our exact life because maybe we chose to be a farmer and we feel poor which is a reality but when you look at the people around us who we have access to you know because of generational wealth being passed down um suddenly there's quite a lot of wealth to be found, whether it's a coworker, a neighbor, a aunt, somebody. Um, and so, you know, our task in this anti-racist program called the Anne Braden program for organizers, for white organizers was to identify those people we have access to because of our place in the world as white people, whether we ourselves feel like we have access to money or not, who around us does. And usually we have access to more people who have access to more money. 
And so this is the reality, you know, and this has become more clear to bring it back to the seeds as I dig into why did I lose my seeds from Southern Italy, from Naples? Why did I lose my seeds from the thatched roof farmhouse in Western Ireland? Because those people decided to assimilate into American culture and access this certain type of whiteness um, where they were able to go to college, they were able to buy houses, they were able to access the GI Bill, they were able to do all these, open all these doors that were open for them that put us in a position to, you know, we lost the land and we lost the seeds to gain a certain level of success. Um, and so while I made a choice to start a company that has not brought a lot of money uh, at, up to this point as a new farm-based seed company, I have access to people in my family and in my community and from my college and from wherever, from my, you know, queer community that is predominantly white and well off um, who have access to um, financial resources and, and land resources. And so to speak to those requests from folks to give the land and give the money, maybe you don't feel you have it, but we have access to people who do. And this is a time to help move money as an act of reparations. Um, if we truly are about supporting the sovereignty of black and brown and indigenous communities. And so we have the ability to do it, even if we don't immediately think, oh, I don't have my money in my bank account. Um, and so the other thing is, as we become, you know, as we do this work and we have access to resources as farmers, as organizations, um, we can hire people, we can decide who to partner with and who not to partner with, we can decide who becomes our seed growers and who doesn't. Um, those are all moments of being a gatekeeper, where we can choose to open the gate for certain people or not. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to move resources. Um, and to use our positions that we're in. Um, even if we don't think of ourselves as having a lot of resources, we, we often have more than we think. So I just wanted to add those things. Yeah, and I think that that also helps answer the question we were asking about what this work looks like in community, right? Because it is much more than just like giving each other cool seeds or telling a story. Um, it is also making sure that we that we are helping each other have the conditions to be able to keep our seeds that we have the right you know i think i think about owen you know your model with the company where it's like not not only am i going to give these farmers these seeds but also the financial support to actually grow them right it's not just about and so that that's actually that that's what builds trust that's what builds community is not just here's this but here's this and i want to make sure that you have everything that you need to do this and to like feel in this connection as deeply um, as you do. And so that's about allyship and all that, but it's also just about, you know, I see you as more than just like a person that is receiving something. I see you as a person who's also on their own journey, who also wants to support their own people. Um, just stepping into that as well. Yeah. And just um, to kind of tie back, you know, the original description of this session or, or what was kind of initially proposed, um, seemed kind of very voyeuristic, right? It was like, oh, well, let's learn about how BIPOC do this, you know, how they keep seeds. And, you know, what this session became is actually the antith antithesis of that. Like it was about how do we do this in relationship to ourself first? And then we can, I, we can see that, right? You can see, like, I, I know that Owen is on this journey, I'm on this journey, Lex is on this journey, like we're all doing this work and there's beautiful intersectionality around that. There can be um, as you develop these relationships. So I just wanna be cognizant of time. You know, we are 15 minutes over. Um, it would be wonderful if you all would like to join at 2 p.m. for part two of this um, where myself, Zainab Muhammad of True Love Seeds and my remaining of Row Seven Seeds are going to be covering more of the the how, the how right? Um, so more technical things around crop planning, pollination, understanding plant life cycles, cleaning, storing seeds, etc. Um, so if there are no, uh, can we get a raised hand? Or if someone wants to wants to share, or even if you'd like to to kind of help us end the session on a positive note with an affirmation or something, um, you know, just beautiful to share with us all. I mean, we are all blown away. We had over a hundred people on a Sunday morning come <laughs> and join us and we're so happy for it. Um, 
and we're still going strong at 68 folks. So, you know, please, if anyone would like to share um, something with us to kind of to end in community and to move forward. I, I have a something that I will try to make really quick. Um, and when I was speaking to the watermelon seeds, Seed Savers Exchange has been um, the recipient and has been gathering you know, seeds for 46 years. And we have this collection of over 20,000 seeds that we're just now finding the resources to sort of manage, you know, kind of getting out of that gathering mode. And these seeds, like we are stewarding them so they can continue their journey. And some of them have found their way back to the people that originally stewarded them. Um, and some are still waiting for that journey. And it's it's about those journeys and those relationships. And so I'm not, but we're also a primarily white organization in Decorah, Iowa, you know, starting these seats. So we are, you know, we're trying to make those connections and find out as much about those seats as we can so that we can get them back to, um, to the people that really want to be stewarding them. and originally started them. We're doing some seed rematriation work, thanks to Rowan White, that has been really informative. And so we have these seeds that may not have their original name. They may not have, they, they, they may not have been given, us, given to us by their original stewards. Um, so digging into those histories, and that's, that's why I invited, um, and why I invite anyone, if like you're looking for seeds and having trouble finding them, we may be able to find something in our collection that isn't that may be what you're looking for. And I obviously can't say that we can do that for sure, but we're, we're stewarding these 20,000 varieties of seeds. Um, and in that process of getting them back out in the community, having them grow on the land with people that love them is really important to all of us. So thank you for that minute or two. Thank you. Um... I wanted to, you know, some, there's been a couple of comments in the chat about like, it's complicated. What is family? What is lineage? How do you, whatever, some of us are mixed. Some of us are this, some of us are that. Like, yes, um, I think we don't want to make it seem like it's some easy, whatever. All of the stories that we've shared, I, I would say probably are the accumulation, accumulation of years of asking questions and doing our own personal work and all of these different things. So it's not just like that, um, you know, but it's, it, this, the, this is the legacy of colonialism that all of us are a part of. It's that disconnection and that brokenness and we all feel it in different ways. Um, and so this is not to diminish anyone's own experience of that, right? But the, all of this is just piecing things back together and we're just all doing our best to do it together. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. As Jackie said, next session is going to be great definitely continue on um all the things are in the chat um is there anything else thanks everybody thanks everyone thank great. you everyone see you at two thank you all bye bye everybody bye, bye. <laughs> <laughs>